so I will take you to the next capagliflozin, conquering new frontiers in DKD prevention therapy. This group of drugs entered the Indian market more than five years back. It came in as anti-diabetic drugs with good metabolic advantages like weight loss and reduction of blood pressure as well. Good A1C reduction and can be combined with any group of drugs because it is an insulin independent action. So you can combine with oral drugs, you can combine with insulin, beautiful anti-diabetic drugs, with added benefits of weight loss and PP benefit. So really, um, as far as diabetes is concerned, these drugs in the first couple of years when they entered the market, they changed the scenario where diabetes could be managed in addition to weight loss, which was something really very important because we did not have effective weight loss therapies uh, before. So this was an advantage the patients got in addition to sugar control and good weight loss as well with uh, the SGLT inhibitor, especially tapagliflose. So let's start with this patient of ours. He is a prototype patient. This is only for educational purpose. He is having a, a worsening kidney function. He's 55 years old. Diabetes five years on anti-diabetic drugs is a triple combination of SE, MET, and TPP4 inhibitor at full doses. He's got hypertension, dyslipidemia, so basically typical metabolic syndrome. He's not yet got a CV in the heart failure. He's taking standard hypertension and lipid lowering drugs. So he's on high intensity statin, which is indicated for all of patients of diabetes by most most world authorities, whether it is a ESC or whether it is a um, AHA, they really recommend very high intensity statins for, for patients with type 2 diabetes. It's already on ACE inhibitor, CCV as per guidelines. So he's on basic background therapy for hypertension and, and uh, standard background therapy for hypertension and, is, and for dyslipidemia. He's on triple drug anti diabetic therapy. His A1C is not bad. If you see his here, his A1C is not very bad. His A1C is not very bad. It's about it's just about 6.8. However, see his GFR, 6, 6 mm. So he's already got into got into stage 2 CKD. And his USCR is 800. So that's really macroalbuminuria. You know, 0 to 30 is normal, 30 to 300 is microalbuminuria. And 800 is macroalbuminuria, almost reaching a gram of albuminuria. So he typically has diabetes only. He's done 55 years of age. Has diabetes only for five years, along with comorbidities, hypertension, dyslipidemia, already on good background therapy. Evans is not bad, but look at his GFR, which should be at least over 90 for his age of 55. He's already dropped to about 66, and his albuminuria is huge. So, really, this patient is a really very high risk for, for kidney progression, for also for, for cardio, cardiovascular disease. And since his last eight months' visit, he's, he's gained about Two kg's weight, his GFR is dropped by about 5 ml. So, and his USR is gone up by 20%. So, he's progressing. See, the rate of fall of GFR by age is about 1 ml per, per minute per year. Here, we lost, he's dropping about 5. So, that's really, and this is very, very, um, a very, very difficult thing in India. The rate of progression of CKD in India is much higher than what is seen in the Western population. In Western population, people would progress by about 2 to 4 ml per minute uh, worsening of GFR every year. In India, we are seeing our patients get down by 5 to 10 ml per minute per year. That's really bad because, you see, if it gets down by 5 ml, even if you say this conservative figure of 5 ml per minute, in the next 10 years, he's, he's going to go on dialysis. He's at 66 per minute, which in 10 years, he comes to ESRD, uh, uh, CKD stage 5, less than 15 GFR and he would typically require dialysis. So something really urgently needs to be done in this gentleman is high cardio renal risk, high cardiovascular risk. We are going to see that a little while from now. And we need to really stop his declining, halt his declining his GFR. The rate of decline of GFR really needs to be reduced in this particular patient so that he doesn't get into dialysis in the next 10 years. So that is typically what we are looking at. How can we do that? Beautiful. Fortunately, we have agents now which have shown some phenomenal evidence for doing, doing what this patient would be required. Right. So when you when you when you basically diagnose CKD, you have the two classification, the A on the x-axis and the y-axis, you are seeing the, the, the stage of the of the CKD. 
so basically g1 gfr more than 90 then mild ckd or patient has typically 66 gfr gets it to g2 and then but however in the drop fire will permeate is going to drop in the next couple of years to stage 3a over the next few years to stage 3b and is going to progress to ckd in stage 5 Uh, G5 and that would require new indication for getting into dialysis. So typically, our patients is over here, and this albuminuria is then again classified as A1, which which is normal to micro normal albuminuria, micro albuminuria, and macro albuminuria. The patient is here. So if you just chart our patient on the on both axes and he is right over here, he is on A3 G2. So this patient is A3 G2. Also, we need to see his etiology so clearly. Is this? He seems to be having a diabetic kidney disease. Of course, one needs to look non-diabetic kidney disease in all patients, especially when proteinuria is not very large and if retina is normal. Those are the indicators that it may be a non-diabetic kidney disease. So we really need to rule out other causes as well. However, diabetic kidney disease more than 50% of patients on dialysis in our country, for that matter, in every part of the world, the etiology of this CKD is diabetes. So clearly, other differential diagnoses have to be kept in mind. The diabetes is the forerunner, is the is the front runner actually. So this patient has G two A three C K D and would progress over the years to over to from G two to G five and was already in A three that would get severe and he would typically end up with with G five and with dialysis in the next ten years uh, if, if if intervention is not done by and if, if, if an immediate intervention and a, Urgent intervention, effective intervention is not done to prevent him from progressing further down the track. Right. So this is what uh, what we are saying again. Uh, as you go from you go from the top, the G1 to G2, to A1 to A3, the risk increases. And what risk increases? It's not just the risk of end stage kidney and progressive kidney disease. There's also the CV mortality and all cause mortality. Albuminuria is a marker of endothelial dysfunction. Albuminuria is a marker of cardiovascular risk. This patient is huge cardiovascular risk. In fact, most of our patients who would present like this would probably die of a cardiovascular disease before they get into dialysis. So it's very important to address this cardiorenal risk for this patient. The progressive CKD uh, reduce the all-cause mortality, CV mortality, halt the progression of CKD. Not let him get into a ESRD. He is 55 years of age. We need to keep his kidney functioning at least for the next twenty years, if not more. So really, we need. We, he's over. He's over here now. A three and G two. This is very. He's is a moderate risk patient now, and he would soon, soon go with higher protein urea to, 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 and with the reducing GFR a couple of years in here, and then of course he would just progress in downhill. So can we stop him from falling downhill? Can we stop his kidney from kidney disease work from worsening? Can we stop him from getting into dialysis for at least for the next 20-25 years? And can do we have interventions and evidence for those interventions? And fortunately, yes, we have a lot of these interventions and evidence for this intervention, which we are going to see further. So, what is the unmet need for CKD management over a long time? This is this has been very intriguing. For the last 20 years, nothing major has come up. Nothing major has come up. See, the the burden of kidney disease is huge. It's, If the it's a sub if the the prevalence is substantial and serious implications for costs and outcomes of healthcare. So if you see the figures globally, one out of ten people get CKD. 2.6 million receive uh, receive renal replacement. 1.2 million deaths annually, and uh, the number of renal replacement is still increased by 5 million by 2030, and it's driven by aging, increasing hypertension and diabetes. These are the two worst. And a combination of these two expressions is the worst combination for the kid. Uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, add to it smoking, and that becomes a really deadly combination for the cardiovascular axis, especially the kidney. What we are seeing over here, and almost developed nations, this spend two to three percent of their annual health care budget on ESG, and this is actually uh, uh, twice the cost of ESG treatment. So basically, this is a huge burden in terms of cost, in terms of Morbid morbidity in terms of mortality, and if you see the see the uh, distribution, a large large part part of that is actually driven by diabetes. The purple thing over here, and the age group. If you see, if you see, 
you are getting getting it across the age, especially in the younger ages in our country. And diabetes is the front runner; is the main is the main culprit, which is which is running this uh, this uh, 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 epidemic of uh, diabetes and of course of complications of diabetes like nephropathy and CKD. And the CKD mortality has come down. If you see over the years, and this is from 2007 to 17, ischemic heart disease has come down by 9.7 percent. Of course, data from the West, <coughs> stroke has come down by 13.6 percent. COPD has come down by 13.6 percent. Look at the kidney disease; it's gone up by 1.5. That's really that's really, the mortality has gone up by 1.5 over year as compared to the other. Diseases like ischemic heart disease, strokes, and COPD have come down. And then see the number of patients receiving RRT. This is from 2010 to 2020. You see across the spectrum. If you see the Oceania and Africa and Latin America and Europe and North America, it's steadily progressing. But look at Asia, where we fall. It's really going going up quite high. The number of patients RRT million. It already was almost 1.5 million in the Asian population, as compared to the Western population. Also, there is a trend to go up, uh, especially also in the North American North American population. But look at look at in the Asian population, progression is much faster and uh, worsening is much faster with a uh, lot, lot of patients receiving renal replacement therapy. So it's clear that the burden of the disease is huge. The progression is rapid in our country. Asia and our country, especially, progression as I told you, the fall in the GFR can be very rapid. Patient can progress to, from a GFR of 40 to to to, 12, to less than 20 and less than 15. That is stage five CKD. Over a period of a couple of years, we have seen patients falling down ill and requiring dialysis in a short time. If NSAIDs are are the insult which may be responsible, the uh, non-proven therapies, Ayurvedic stuff. Is also maybe implicated patients' compliance with treatment and and with uh, monitoring and and lifestyle is also again a very important factor. Patients usually want shortcuts and get into all these things actually land up in big trouble. So clearly the progression is, is faster. Patients receiving RRT is huge in the Asian subcontinent. Right now, this is what was what was found from 1997 to 2013. And some of them have seen the seen the market, and some of them have not. You have seen Ramipril was the first hope study, micro hope. Professor Salim Yusuf, way back 1997, huge study. But he hope set the stage for large studies in, in in the era of medicine and diabetes, in particular, clearly showing showing uh, 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 that the progression of CKD can be halted by Ramipril. Then came the ARBs. Evidence was not initially with the ARP, so one was not sure whether they do as good as Ramipril. But of course, Ibesartan had evidence with that. And I did study Losartan in the renal and Olmesartan is roadmap clearly showing in pre patients with CKD, you can get a reduction of, of a progression of CKD. And so these were the drugs which were standard, which are now standard of established as standard of care for a very long time, that these drugs can halt the progression of kidney disease. There's a compelling indication. To use this drugs with hypertension or albuminuria or a combination of both to halt the progression of kidney disease. So these ARBs have the evidence, the asymptomatics have the evidence. However, after that, a combo was used, and the combo was showing was shown to have a lot of hyperkalemia, a lot of adverse effects, and the studies were stopped, stopped uh, prematurely, and then combos actually uh, are contraindicated now for, for CKD. Then came the renin inhibitor. Um, Eliskerin again went off the market because it did not show good effects. Sulodexide was was tried and that, uh, that also failed to show any benefits. And then you have the uh, bardoxolone methyl, uh, which was tried. So all these therapies after 2011 and many more were not shown over here actually. So whether it's a combo of inhibitor ARB or any inhibitor or the other uh, other experimental drugs, a lot of them were tried. None of them saw the saw the saw the light of the day because they either had too many adverse effects or they were not very, very good on the efficacy part of it. So we are stuck up at 2011 after 2011. We have not had meaningful uh, uh, progress, almost a decade now, any meaningful progress or any new additions to this standard of therapy. 
it can halt the progression, progressive drop in kidney function, namely the GFR. Right, and that is how the ZLT2 actually have come to our rescue. We can say these drugs have really added life to patients of diabetes with kidney disease. The evidence is far more reaching than even the ACE inhibitor ERB data. Dedicated studies for for DAPA, DAPA glyphosin available, the DAPA CKD study, which we are going to also touch upon. And the CBOT outcome studies of SGLT2 inhibitors showed good renal benefits. Dedicated studies available with DAPA glyphosin and CANA glyphosin have shown very good benefits for this for this group of drug, drugs as far as the kidney is concerned. And there may be a lot of, lot of, so basically one has to understand that this anti diabetic effect of the drug is dependent on GFR. So basically for a good anti-diabetic effect, weight loss you, and A1C control, you require a good GFR of about 60, you get good benefits. Up to 45, you get modest benefits. And really after that, you don't get any much diabetic, anti-diabetic effect below 30, you would not get any meaningful A1C reduction. However, the cardiorenal benefits of these drugs, namely heart failure, the pump and the filter, the kidney, the pump and the filter, this drug group of drugs in, in general and apoglyphosin in particular, which has now a dedicated heart failure study, pump failure study, the DAPIHF study, which is published, which immense benefit in diabetes as well as non-diabetes population. The DAPA CKD study with kidney with, with really lower kidney function showing again good benefits in the diabetic and even non-diabetic population. So one has to understand. That these drugs, these, these benefits to the heart and kidney are different from the anti hyper uh, from the anti diabetic effect of the drugs, which really does not depend on the GFR. This cardiorenal benefits, and we are totally talking basically of the renal benefits, are seen even with GFR below 45, where the latest KDCO guidelines say that you can continue the drug, you cannot you can start the drug up to above 45, you can continue it with up to 30, and you can continue it to up to dialysis. Not start below 30. They say do not start below 30. If the patient is already on the drug for the renal benefits, you can continue to bring the drug till the end point of dialysis. And this data has come from the DAPA CKD study. The DAPA CKD study had enrolled patients with the GFR as low as 25. I was fortunate to be a part of the study as an investigator, and the study went on for more than two years, more than 4,000 patients across the world, diabetes as well as non diabetic population, and really showing overwhelming benefits. The Creden study was was uh, was published about a couple of years back, which showed good benefits with cannabinoids. It was thrilling at that point of time. The results were much better than the ACE inhibitor ERB data, uh, benefit data. So it, it was the word used for the Creden study data was was overwhelming benefits. So huge benefits seen for for RS, for for reducing the progression of uh, of CKD and loss of GFR. Now the results of adaptogenic when they came. They were unforeseen. The word used is unforeseen. So for the credence, it was overwhelming. And for the DAPA CKD studies, oh, it is, it is unforeseen. That means better than the overwhelming. Huge benefit. All-cause mortality coming down. End point of doubling of serum creatinine, dialysis, renal replacement therapy. Huge benefits. The study had to be stalled, called off prematurely because of nominal benefits in the DAPA glucosin patients. So, the data is, is absolutely uh, so positive that I would go and say it's, it's a crime not to give this drug to a patient of, C, uh, of, of CKD with a diabetic or non-diabetic to stop the progression of kidney function. Because as you have seen, after 2011, there has not been anything really major. So these drugs are actually a, a, actually a, actually a, 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 a elixir for patients with, with CKD to stop the progressive kind of kidney function. And there could be multiple mechanisms which are involved. And the main mechanism which is being, which is thought to be the, the most important mechanism is tubular glomerular blood feedback restoration, the TGF. So basically you have the afferent arterial and the efferent arterioles. And then there is glomerular hyperfiltration and glomerular increased glomerular pressure. The glomerular hypertension is the, is the main feature of diabetic kidney disease which causes proteinuria and declining kidney function. And there's GLT2 inhibitors because of this uh, uh, reabsorption of gl glucose over here, changes the, the tone of the afferent arterial. It gets the 
the, the restores the, 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 the global low pressure, reduces the global low pressure, and therefore that seems to be the seems, seems to be the main mechanism. So basically, what happens is there is because there is a blocking of the sodium and glucose reabsorption over here, and it goes down. There is dietary urea because because of uh, the SGLT normally the SGLT2 would bring it back, would reabsorb all this. Block this with the inhibitor. This all glycosuria goes down, and um, um, uh, sodium resorption also goes down. Sodium and glucose reabsorption stop. So therefore, less sodium reaches the macula densa. Less, less sodium reaches the macula densa. That gets the tone of the afferent arterial to normal, and that. That reduces the intraglobular pressure. That reduces the protein. So that seems to be the major mechanism. There could be other other ones like uh, uh, pro-inflammatory pathway activation is is reduced. Uh, direct tubular toxicity is reduced. There is improved cardiac function. The hematocrit increased oxygen delivery to the kidney. Improvement in renal hypoxia. So these are four five major mechanisms which the slide has. Highlighted, which which may be the reason, which is the mechanism of action for the kidney benefit with this drug. And if you see this cardiovascular outcome studies, the uh, you see the strength of this kidney outcome study with with uh, canagliflozin. Uh, you had 4,000 plus patients, but you'll see the number of patients with the GFR more less than 60 were about 60 percent patients had had a GFR less than 60. So. Really low GFR patients over here. Mean GFR of this study was 56.2. This is a dedicated renal outcome study, primary renal outcome, outcome study, for whose benefits I have, as I have told you. Empiric was a CV outcome study. There were only about, say, 25% patients, more than 25% patients, with a GFR less than 60. Others had fairly good GFR. Canvas, again, had a large number of patients with good with a GFR above 60, only about 20% with GFR below 60. Yeah. Declare TB was a predominantly primary prevention for with only only about eight percent patients having a GFR less than sixty. So these are different cohorts. You cannot compare head to head, but look at the cohorts the differences. Whereas this is a this is a kidney outcome study with a large number of patients, almost sixty percent with GFR less than sixty. You see the mean GFR of patients of MRI and of Canvas and of Declare TB. So. This is the lowest, and of course, it goes on progressively going up. The kidney had less sick patients as kidney is concerned, and even the even with that, all these across this process, this spectrum of CV outcome studies, where actually the patients with stage three CKD were actually very low, benefits were seen for the kidney in terms of endpoints of dialysis, renal replacement, uh, fifty percent drop drop in, in in GFR, and this of course was the one which established that even in patients with a low GFR. You get huge renal benefits with uh, with the canagliflozin in the Credence study. So across the spectrum, the renal benefits, similarly for heart failure, across the spectrum, the heart benefits are seen with all of these drugs. Right. So this is declared to me. This is a renal composite endpoint, and renal composite and uh, composite anti endpoint was 40% increase in GFR to less than 60. Uh, ESRD dialysis for more than 19 years, kidney transplantation. TFR less than 15, renal or CV death, very hard outcomes, pre specified outcomes, a secondary outcomes in the declared kidney. Remember, declared kidney is a, is a primary CV outcome study, with secondary is pre specified kidney outcomes. You are seeing a 24% reduction in the composite or endpoint of kidney. So, really huge benefits. And even with, even with, the, even with the population whose GFR is about 85, so very healthy GFR, and my albuminuric patient is only about 30%. Only 30% patients with albuminuria. That means the remaining 70% have normal albuminuria. So very early in the kidney disease, still you are seeing this very nice benefits in the in the in the declared kidney study. So renal benefits have been phenomenal with this group of drugs, especially with napagliflozin, and in the population which matches to what patients we see in our day to day practice. Remember, this, the canvas has sick patients. Only about say one or two out of ten, uh, 10 patients would be of can can or can canvas. Uh, or canvas or credence uh, type patients. The remaining seven eight patients are prime are healthy patients with fairly normal GFR. And the evidence is only with napagliflozin for these patients or or halting the progression of kidney disease. 
at 24% in the composite endpoint. Again, renal specific outcome, you're removing this only GFR more than 40%, ESR renal death. Again, you're seeing a huge, a huge 47% benefit, 47% benefit for renal outcomes. So that is data is 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 overwhelming. It is overwhelming. And that's why I said if you're not giving this drug for a patient with, with CKD and and uh, with CKD and uh, 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 if there are no contraindications, then I think it's, it's you're not doing the right thing. It's not doing justice. And this 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 particular benefit works in across the EGFR groups and with patients with or without ST related cardiology. So say the baseline GR of GFR more than 90, 60 to 90 or, or less than 60, all across you are seeing good benefits, overall population is over here. You're getting good benefits with uh, dapagliflozin in the primary composite renal outcome. And again, the primary composite renal outcome in patients, overall populations with established disease or without established disease. 60% patients of the dactylicular team study were patients with multiple risk factors without established cardiovascular disease. 40% had established cardiovascular disease. Both the groups, you are seeing very good renal outcomes, irrespective of whether the patient has established cardiovascular disease or no, irrespective of what GFR is throughout the spectrum. So a large variety of your patients, a large group of your patients are going to benefit from this drug for the renal, for the renal outcomes. This is what it is. The application of the drug is, is, is for a large population. Right. Now, across the baseline CV in this category, GFR categories, whether the patient had established disease or CV disease only risk factors, whether he had heart failure or no at baseline, whether he had hypertension or no at baseline, whether his GFR was what. We have seen some of this data in the previous slide. Across the spectrum, we are seeing huge benefits for dapagliflozin uh, over here. So, as I told you, large number of patients, whether they have established CVD or no, whether they have heart failure or no, whether they have hypertension or no, whether they are falling in which GFR, category of GFR, across the spectrum, dapagliflozin is giving you positive renal benefits. Now, across the USCR, we have seen the previous data, across USCR, HBA1C, and medicine categories. So it doesn't depend what, what their normal albuminuria normal or microalbuminuria. Or macro it doesn't depend whether they are less than seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, or more than nine. It doesn't matter if you are an ACE inhibitor or ARB or no, or whether the diuretic or no. Across the spectrum, again, you are seeing benefits across the spectrum. So, irrespective of the baseline GFR, the albuminuria, the use of ACE inhibitor ARB, that's really important because a lot of our patients get hyperkalemia as well. And one has to withdraw these drugs for hyperkalemia. So that this so even in those patients who are not in this hyperkalemia or with AC inhibitor, you can with, with the drugs you get added benefit. Even without the drugs, you get benefit. So those patients really benefit the for kidney protection. Right. And credence compared to the credence population, even in patients with more advanced CKD, as I told you, the the this is this is this is uh, Outcome from the kidney from the credence study, you're getting primary outcome, uh, composite outcome, each component of the composite outcome, renal death, CV death, and if you see except CV death, all other components are 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 are, are significant and except for for renal death and, C, and and CV death, I think the composite is positive, ESKD is positive, renal death, renal outcomes are positive, and and then um, so these are the one, two, and three. As the three, four are the outcomes if it's less than hazard ratio one. So we're getting wonderful benefit with canagliflozin with uh, in the credence study. We have patients with more, much lower GFRs across the spectrum and composite each each of the each of the uh, each of the each of the components of the composite in an outcome, which is which is doubling of serum creatinine, ESKD, or C V death or uh, or uh, uh, composite of all them, all of this seems to be significantly valid. So that that was study the the study which set the ball rolling. These drugs are good for the kidney, and DAPA CKD only confirmed that and confirmed that in a much bigger and better way. So let the what, what the guidelines have done? Has the guidelines have the guidelines with the various organizations came after this evidence has come? Yes, this is the, the European Renal Association and the. Uh, 
recommend switching to an SGLT2 inhibitor plus metformin when patients with CKD with type 2 diabetes A1C of S or metformin plus another so it is the the effect on the kidney is independent of glycemia so even if your patients are less than 7 A1C with other drugs it is a compelling indication to shift them to an SGLT2 inhibitor because of these benefits in the Graydon study and in the DAPA CKD the declare study was not for more and the, and the canvas and the entire outcome for the first ones to set the ball rolling but these dedicated studies have meant that in patients with t2d's dmckd not at goal you that is the 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 the, the, the uh, ckd is defined as a gfr less than 60 and microalbuminuria or macromia even the gfr more than 60 so the patient not at goal definitely as glt2 If you're still at goal, SGLT2 is not, uh, then you, but not SGLT2 is not tolerated of 100. Then use a GLT2. But here, even if your patient is on less than seven, it is a compelling indication to switch from the other agent to SGLT2 inhibitor and use GLT if your SGLT2 is, is not tolerated. So, but the, both the drugs have evidence for PD, the GLT as well as GLT2, but the GLT evidence is much much lower. Uh, lesser as compared to the SGLT2 injectable drugs. The GLT costly, cost cost is a huge issue. Injectable is a issue. Oral drug dapagliflozin really can can uh, uh, be used for for kidney protection even with the baseline A1C less than seven percent. So those are that is how the how the guidelines are 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 uh, have changed. This is how the guidelines have changed. European Dialysis and Transplant Association and the European uh, Renal Association. So this is ASN. Hmm? This is American Society of Nephrology. And again, here you are just saying if your patient has DKD, diabetic kidney disease, you a macroalbuminuria, SGLT2 inhibitor. The GFR is more than 30, SGLT2 less than 30, maybe a GLP receptor, high risk of HHF, SGLT2 inhibitor. Cardiovascular risk, either one of them. So for best benefits. You can use either of them for heart failure and for the renal benefits. SGLT2 inhibitors are the one which has massive benefits for for heart failure, pump failure, and the filter, pump and the filter, or the pipes, the atherosclerosis. Either one of them have been used, but far as far as the pump and the filter, and the filter, the main evidence is with the SGLT2 inhibitor. That is that is preferred over uh, over the GLP one. So you can risk the score for heart failure. And the score you just add up the points. The score is more than equal to two. Then SGLT2 high risk of heart failure. SGLT2 inhibitor becomes a drug of choice over and above the GLP1 uh, agonist. So clearly for heart failure, clearly for renal disease progression, we've seen the data in the previous slides. Huge benefit with dapagliflozin to halt the progression of, of kidney disease. And this is what the KDGO says, and that really that's really very interesting. So patients with 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 uh, Diabetes and CKD, of course, my, of course, uh, lifestyle intervention, and of course, metformin. If your GFR comes below 45, reduce dose. If less than 30, you do stop metformin. Or risk of lactic acidosis. Here, if a patient is on the 30, do not start the SGLT2, but you continue up to dialysis. That's really important. That's because the DAPA CKD involved patient up to 25 uh, GFR. And as investigators being a part of the study, we were encouraged to continue the drug for the patient till the patient reached reached the end point of dialysis, which we did. And therefore, this KDGO has given this recommendation algorithm that you can continue it up to dialysis. An additional drug, if required, and of course we have the GLP-1 or the DPP-4 or of course the insulin other anti-diabetic drugs. But clearly, patients with CKD now SGLT2 inhibitor like that like. Dapagliflozin is what the KDGO strongly advises, and continue up to dialysis. That's again a very, very bold recommendation in the algorithm. So I think uh, we have come to the end of that presentation for dapagliflozin and kidney disease. And uh, I thank the organizers for this opportunity to come talk. And uh, that is it from my side.